Well, this morning we're, we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. Now, we're not going to, to cover the full breadth of the miracles because there's a couple coming up in our reading that Pastor Chris will speak to. But the miracles we're going to, to speak to today are ones of mainly of healing, of our Lord's healing of those he comes in contact with. I mean, the reason that we pray these prayers right now is because we see that our Lord can do this, and he does it. And so let us, even when these prayers are answered, give him all the glory. So what are miracles of Christ, the ones that we see right here in Scripture? Well, they're expressions of God's power and the divinity of of Christ, so you have that in your blank there, the divinity of Christ, testified authoritatively in the Bible, which signified the coming of the salvation that was associated with the kingdom of God. Is that last blank there, the kingdom of God. And we're going to get more into that, but... So that's what we have as the definition there. We're going to unpack more of that as we go down through this list. So you might have some questions right now about, okay, what does all that mean? We're going to, we're going to get to it. Now, the miracles of Christ are exercises of the power of God, which Christ wielded fully in his incarnation as the divine son. And so... I'm, I want us to remember this about Jesus even as we think through our Lord never sinned, okay? There's not a single one of us in here because yes, he, he never sinned in the flesh that we're in that desires sin all the time. I mean, we're just sinful and we need our Savior to save us from that sin so that we can live for him, but he never sinned. Yet, while he was walking among us, he had the power to heal. He had the power to cast out demons. He had the power to restore the dead, yet he never sinned. I want, I want y'all to think about this just in that perspective. If you had this type of power in a sinful, Body, to where you could just at any time say this and this happens and say this and this happens and say this and this happens. You know, a professor of mine um, at Southeastern, he, he just kind of made it a little lighthearted so we could understand it. He said, it's like the State Farm commercial. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there with a sandwich. Boom, there's a sandwich. With a hot tub. Boom, there's a hot tub. You know, Jesus could do this at any time. Just like we talked about last week, the devil is tempting him and he knows the Son of God can do these things. He can turn a rock into bread. But yet, through the whole time, all the time, Jesus is acting on the will of the Father. At every moment in his ministry. So there's not a selfish action that he takes ever. Now we have another worldview of Christ. And this is, you know, there's many, 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 many worldviews. But this is more of the worldview that we encounter here in America. And it's a materialistic, that's their blank there, materialistic or naturalistic worldview that says the universe is an impersonal system whose basic character is matter, energy, and motion. It's just random chaos in this worldview. So within it, there's no room for a personal God. There's no room for spirits or angels or demons or departed spirits. So miracles are disregarded altogether right at the beginning from those that hold to a materialistic or naturalistic worldview. I mean, Thomas Jefferson even tried to write a Bible with this worldview. You can't change the word of God. I don't care if your face is on whatever mountain or whatever or whatever piece of money. No, sir. A 
materialistic or a naturalistic worldview just disregards miracles altogether. But here's the thing that's true, is the world that we experience is actually a world created and maintained by God. And so there's regularities of his faithful rule over the world. I mean, it's, there's a, a system that goes on around us. This, there is a flow that takes place. You know, every, you know, it's, it's Nathaniel's birthday today, and, you know, we got Nathaniel a Lego box for his birthday. And so when I asked Jenny Ruth, I said, Jenny Ruth, say we take this Lego box and we just throw it into that room. And we come back a thousand years later. Those Legos are going to be put together? No, sir. She gets it. She said it. She gets it. Somehow, in this worldview, it's been missed by those who've lived a lifetime. That it doesn't just happen randomly and impersonally and in the system of chaos. No, we have one who rules. And when he does something exceptional, that we're like, whoa, within his rule, we call that a miracle. And we give him glory. Now see, in, in another worldview, and this may even be the majority of the world because the majority of the world actually does believe in spirits. I mean, they do. They worship spirits. And their prejudice against the reality of the miracles that we see from Jesus because they're prejudiced against who Christ actually is. So that's what we have in that, that blank there. People are prejudiced against the reality of the miracles because they are also prejudiced against who Christ actually is. So we have people that worship within spiritual realms and people that say there's no spirits at all, but all are rejecting Jesus. But here's that the miracles of the Gospels show Christ's divine power. And the miracles that Jesus has worked, here's the thing I really want us to get here. They were foretaste of this two-stage deliverance. His resurrection from the dead and our resurrection of the body in union with the power his resurrection. So it's a two-stage deliverance that we have in him, in his resurrection from the dead and our resurrection. And so what I want us to, to, when we think about, okay, what is he showing us with these miracles? What is Jesus, I mean, we're, it's not just without purpose. As we see the miracles of Jesus, they are not without purpose. And so in his miracles, he gives us a picture of the resurrection. And we're going to get to it even more. But in your resurrected body, do you believe you're going to be blind? If you were blind, you're not going to be able to hear. You'll be lame. No. No. His kingdom does not have that. And so he is even showing in a picture of all these people, even the cripple that's laying right here on the ground, they can be a part of my kingdom. Care for them, love them. They are my little ones. This person that's over here and sick with leprosy that you're saying, don't go touch them. No, care for them, love them. They are my little ones. And I take away their iniquities is what the Lord is saying. If they put faith in me, in their resurrected body. And all the people now have this opportunity in their resurrected body to live out the miracles that we see right here. See, these folks all died. They did. But when they come back in our resurrected body, they will be as Christ has made them to be. They will be walking. They will be able to see. We will too. And we'll see him. So we see this picture of his kingdom. And let's look at 
some of these miracles. First, I want us to go to a place where there's a whole lot of miracles that take place at once. And so that's in Luke chapter 4. Thirty-eight through forty-four. Now he's just cast out demons, and now he's rose and he's left the synagogue and he's in, entered into Simon's house. Those of you who have been to Capernaum, I, I don't know, if, maybe I think a couple of you have. If you're, you're there at the temple, and then you just turn around and leave the temple, and you walk maybe 100 yards, and you're at Peter's house. And so that's, that's how close in proximity. You can see the temple from the ruins of Peter's house. And so when we're thinking about this, he arose and he left the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. He's walking about the length of a football field to get there. And so you got this crowd of people that are following him because they just saw a man get having a demon cast out of him. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever. He appealed to him on her behalf. He stood over her and rebuked the fever that left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. She immediately rose and began to be a host of the house. So you have this casting a fever that's removed. And then what are we able to do with that fever removed? Serve. In the kingdom of God, we don't have these fevers. What are we able to do? We're able to serve the Lord. Now we have this, this point, you know, where it's, you know, even in the book of John, where it's talking about all that was captured with what Christ did. There wouldn't be any you know, anything enough to hold it. And so we just had this. Now the sun was setting, and all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying, You're the Son of God. He rebuked them, and would not allow them to speak, because they knew. He was the Christ. All those who are sick, casting out demons. And so through the healings of others, he is showing us what he is going to do by taking away the sins of the world. Now, on a side note in this passage, I want us to know that Peter was married. You know, we're talking about things that seem obvious because it's in the word of God, but yet there's millions of people that don't believe Peter is ever married. And so they have popes and, and a disregard for what the Bible says. Let us never be found as people who disregard what the Bible says, ever. So that's just a side note there. But Jesus came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that he has shown us through every action, so this is what we must do as well. We can show people the kingdom of God, bearing fruit in all that we do, interacting with those that are lost and showing them what it means to be set apart to live a life for Christ. Does that mean that we look different than they look? Yes, it does. Because we're called to live a, a life of righteousness. And so while we want to take this love to the people, Jesus took love to the people. The sick, various diseases, and he healed every single one of them. Let's take love to the people. Now here's the, this passage here is, is also recorded in Mark, I think it's a blank there, and Matthew. And Matthew adds this reference. And so I want us to see this in, even in the picture of Jesus' miracles because it's, it's in the Gospel of Matthew directly connected to this passage. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. 
Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So you see that picture of healing that takes place? And the greatest thing is, is that we're not just healed from these iniquities, pestilences, nor healed from sin. That what really does bind us. And so, I, I, I mean, a picture that's horrifying of the binding of sin we can see in this next passage in, in Luke chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 26. Then they sail to the country of the Gernesis, which is opposite of Galilee. And when Jesus had stepped down on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. And for a long time he had worn no clothes, not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. And many at a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound in chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds, be driven by a demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What's your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not, not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs were feeding there on the hillside. They begged him to let them enter into those. He gave them permission. The demons came out of the man, into the pigs. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told the city and the country. People went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus, found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, cloaked in his right mind. And they were afraid. This man is afflicted by demons, possessed living a life, being driven by evil. And at the word of God, in the reception of a miracle, he is in his right mind, clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. All of us are a bunch of sinners who by the grace of Jesus will be found clothed setting in his feet. All of us who are believers. So let's not even try to separate ourselves from this man. And the, the crazy thing is, I've actually seen like a person like this. It scared me. I get it. It wasn't, it wasn't to the point that he broke the chains, though. So we were, and just so you kind of get a, the, this evil that still takes place in our world. I was driving through um, Dhaka, which is the capital of Bangladesh, with traffic's everywhere. It's horrible, horrible, horrible traffic. But you see absolutely everything in traffic. And so one day, I'm riding with you know, a friend of mine, a national partner there now, and look over and I see that there's a, there's a man on a bicycle. And so it's like a bicycle you know, man here, but on the back of that, there's just this big flat back which is what we call a vanguard. So basically, it's like a, a little bicycle wagon that you use to tow stuff places. But instead of having anything on the back of it, there was a man. He had a chain around his, or he had a collar around his neck, and he had no clothes on, and there were, and there were four chains coming off from this collar. 
and they were all connected to edges there. And he was chained down completely to this bed of this thing being driven around by a man on a bicycle. And I just looked and I asked the national partner, I said, well, what is this? He said, this is this man's religion. This is this man's religion. To be bound in chains. And then you go to some of these Hindu temples and you see, yeah, this is this man's religion. To be bound in chains. And so what are we to do? Well, we need to take the gospel to them. Jesus has given us a picture of what the gospel does for them. People that are bound in chains and tormented by demons. How do we do it? Just like we talked about with Afghanistan, first we pray. We can't do it all. But we can do what the Lord has placed in front of us. And we do know that there is hurt all over the world. So we can find ways to give and to help and to go. But the people, they had a different response. The people that were surrounding the country, they asked him to depart from them. They were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone and begged that they might be, not be with them. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city much Jesus had done for him. We ask him to declare how much God has done for him. We see this in scripture right here, very clear reference within this miracle. And he went and declared how much Jesus had done for him. So he did. He declared how much God had done for him. And this is the only account right here where we have, when, when Jesus asked for people to go declare, it's not with the nation of Israel yet. Even still, because he knows his time has not come at this point. And so there's, he's across the other, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So this is, you know, more, it's to, even still today, it's the Arab people that live on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And it's seven different nations that, that live over there are tribals, people. He allowed the gospel to go out from there, but the people didn't want anything to do with it. They were scared. And so they asked him to leave. But then he returned. And this is our story that we had. The crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man, Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue, falling at Jesus' feet. He implored him at once to come to his house. He had only one daughter. She was about 12 years of age. She was dying. And Jesus went. The people pressed around him. So there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. And she came up behind him touched the fringe of his garment, the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling falling down before him and declared in his presence all the people she had touched him she had been immediately healed and he said to her daughter your faith has made you well go in peace her faith so you got all these people crowding around him I want to be close to Jesus only one of them came to him with faith and they were healed you got all kinds of people like, yeah, I want to be close to Jesus. I want to be a part of that. 
It's only those that come to him in faith and receive the healing. I mean, I, I mean, I've been a part of crowds like this, like people. I've you know, been a person that's had to protect people from crowds, basically. Like you know, people I worked with. Sometimes it would be a responsibility of mine to be able to help them get through a crowd successfully. And so I know what this is like. You got people just pressing in on you on all kinds of sides and all they want to do is just touch you. But then there's this one person who touches Jesus and receives healing. It's because of her faith. And while he's still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter's dead. No trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this answer, him, do not fear. Only believe and she will be well. When he came to the house, he called in no one to enter him except for Peter and John and James, and the father and the mother of the child. So that's a place where we can see Jesus did have an inner circle. And when you talk about even in leadership training of people, even Jesus with the 12 disciples that he spent the most time training as leaders, he still even had three that he set aside to four, and he'd do even more. And that was Peter, James, and John. And we see how the gospel spread. And most unfortunately through James. Also through Peter and John. But Jesus it took them into the inner circle. He takes them in. And there's all this weeping and mourning. He says, do not weep for she's not dead, she's sleeping. And they laughed at. I mean, she was dead. Taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. Her spirit returned. She got up at once. He directed that someone, should, something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them not to tell anyone what had happened. And so you see that difference there between the moment where he was at the other nation's Versus the moment he was with the people of Israel. Because his time had not yet come that with them. What we have as we look through these miracles? Well, I mean, we talked about it. He's giving us a picture of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God where there are no lame. There's no blind, there's no lepers, there's no demon. And then what do we see in this passage? What is there not? There's no death. There's no death. And so he gives us these miracles showing us this is the kingdom of God. And he told us, you know, in that previous passage, this is why I've come. To proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Through, so through what he does, and even the miracles we'll be able to get into further on, don't miss that there's a purpose within them. And let's go and let's share the love of Christ with others. So what does Jesus say about us at the reception of the Holy Spirit? Anybody know? What does he say? What are we going to do? Okay. But what kind of works are we going to do? With the power of the Holy Spirit, what kind of works does Jesus say that we'll do? We'll do works greater than even these, right? He says, you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will do works greater than even these. It doesn't mean we're going to raise people from the dead. No, it means we're going to share the gospel that restores all the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Now, can we pray and trust that God will heal? Yes. And can we give all glory to God within that? Yes. I've Shared this example many times because it, I believe it's nothing less than a miracle. 
So I, I just lost my uncle. I loved him so much. I'm trying not to cry. But my aunt was about to die too. You know, it was her, her husband. Uh, she had an aneurysm. And I just like prayed and prayed for the Lord to, to take it. I, mean, I just shared the gospel with him and heard his response to that. And so I was like, okay, I, he can go home and thank you, but I, I'm praying for my aunt. And the next day she goes to the doctor and there's no aneurysm. There's no sign of an aneurysm. Meanwhile, we all have these testimonies, I guarantee it, right? Of seeing the Lord work in these ways. Give Him the glory. Share that good news and tell people this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what God does. His will on earth as it is in heaven is what we're praying. So that's what we want to be people doing too. He's the one performing the miracle. The response of people is to receive it. And it changes everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from your word today, to explore what it means to share in your, your kingdom. Or we're not you. We don't have all power. We have your spirit. So Lord, we pray that we will do your will. We'll be a people that are being found faithful as we've been talking about every single week for the last few weeks and forgive us for not talking about it more. We'll be a people that are found faithful when you return. Until then, Lord Jesus, pray that you will come. In Jesus' name.